Hello. This is Rose Nyland. What? That was I'm sweet. one of the winners of the Publishers Clearing House. Ed <laughs> McMahon wants to see me. Right away. Hey, I have to apologize. I thought this was the Joe Franklin studio. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you why I'm here. I happen to be in town over doing some stuff for the NBC. Of That's right. And, you know, Ed McMahon, our good friend, could not be here. Yeah. But it seems, David, that you are the $1 million winner. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey. I've won a million dollars. <laughs> Shout out to my people. This is Ed McMahon, rolling slow through the suburbs in an unmarked van. I ran the strip in the 80s, brought big fat checks to the ladies. When I showed up at their door, they would start screaming like crazy. Break it in hand over fist, was on the VIP list. I was a verbal gunslinger, and my shots never missed. But now the bills have come due, and my credit score is whacked. So I'm hitting up the winners to get my checks back. Hi, Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon. Remember, I gave you that big check. I'd like to have that check back. If you, I, I'm having some stuff would help a lot. Just a little bit. Because you know, and I knew, you know, the, the, the difference in the situation was, I knew you were making bank on those shirts. <laughs> You know, I knew you were right. I did, I did, I did okay. <laughs> yeah. You look like the Monopoly guy. <laughs> he was, he was, you're driving from town to town in a black top hat and a monocle. <laughs> <laughs> I remember they started bootlegging that just to quickly talk about me for a second. I'll never join you. If you only knew the power of the dark side. When I first saw the dialogue, that said, Luke, I am your father. I said to myself, he's lying. I wonder how they're gonna play that liar. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you kill No, I am your father. Say what? the baldest of them I see her red door and I want to be there black just to see what I think the sea of angels lonely as I alright everyone welcome back to Dose of Reality I'm your host, Brian Staveley. I have Karen with me, as usual, and I have Mike Williams. Mike, what's up, buddy? Hey, Brian. Hi, Karen. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for jumping on. And, I mean, I yeah. guess we'll just get right to it. You had some stuff you wanted to talk about, so, I mean, just get right into it. Yeah, so I wanted to bring maybe some real-life experience uh, to this whole coronavirus, COVID-19 discussion. And um, for about a week now, Brian and Karen... I have a family member that's in hospice and the, uh, the constraints that are in place at hospice are unbelievable. And, uh, it's very, uh, emotionally draining on family members. It's, it's, uh, it's traumatic. Uh, you've got a loved one who is in hospice and, um, typically the way this particular hospice operates and I won't say who they are. And let, let me just say before I even get going that the healthcare workers, the doctors, the physician assistants, the nurses, these are all good people who want to help people and they have good intentions. Unfortunately, as we know, the healthcare workers are some of the most indoctrinated that we run into because they're in a system. They're in a system that is very, very controlled. 
and they don't want anybody going rogue. So you have to walk the line, you know, and tell the company line, I should say. So in any case, um, with hospice, usually the way uh, I was told, and especially this hospice, is the visiting hours were 24-7. So if you have somebody who's dying and they're in hospice, you can go see them. If you want to get up at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. in the morning, you can go visit. And you can have uh, several people in the room at one time to go visit your loved one. Obviously, it has to be a reasonable number so that you don't impact um, the doctor's ability or the nurse's ability to to work with the patient. But um, when uh, when my family member was admitted into hospice, uh, they said to us that only one family member per day can visit. Yeah. Okay. So, and we have uh, between the two families, we have it's it's large. Okay, yeah. eight eight children to be exact. And, um, and the way they explained it and the way it works is if that one person comes in and they limited the hours from 24 seven to 8 AM to 8 PM. So we have a 12 hour window now, which is fine. If one person comes in and let's say they can visit for half a day, four hours mm -hmm. and they leave, yeah. nobody can come in. Nobody can cycle through and be the replacement one body in the room. Mm -hmm. What they're saying is once one person steps into the room, regardless of how long they're there, they can sign in and be there for five minutes. That's it. Nobody else can follow them in. Nobody else can replace their body being in the room. You have to what wait. About the next what about the next day? The next day, they, they reset the, the, um, the head but, count. But but so let me get this right though. If you have a large family, now you're staggering out day, 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 day. Somebody's on hospice. I don't want to say it, but you don't know how long they have. Everybody might not get that day, right? Exactly. So maybe I should explain hospice too. Hospice is for people who are going to die. You go to hospice when you know you're ready to transition to cross over. And so yeah. So if you have uh, eight people in your family, eight children in your family. The way they have it set up is you're going to have to do uh, eight days. Each a, a new person would come in each day, right? So, so then what happened was um, they explained that well, when it gets to the point where death is imminent, they'll increase the number to three. And what kind of emotional thing is that? Like, hey, you can have three now because, by the way, your relatives pretty much on the way out. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what's happened is, and the reason why I wanted to talk about this folks is because, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the news and, you know, we can pick apart that stuff, but to see it in action, to see it, how it really affects people is um, it, for family members. There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of torment, you know, it's people want to see their mother, their father, their grandparent, whatever, before they they depart this world and they're being told if you don't have the right numbers you can't do that you cannot be in the room when your mother your father your grandparent passes away you know so if they're only go going to allow three and you're the fourth person you're out so i had very long discussions with them you know and i said well first of all i said that you know this is unbelievably uh wrong on so many levels. It's, it's immoral. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I've been working with them to, you know, to make some accommodations. We've made some, okay. But we're not there completely. Mm -hmm. Uh, they explained that in some cases with large families, they have allowed, it's not a given up to five people to be in the room. So it's it's causing uh, you know a lot of concern to uh, to family members. Uh, it's crushing to family members. And the thing is, what the point I want to get across is, even though the healthcare workers are they are compassionate and they have empathy, there is a robotic mechanical process that's in place mm -hmm. where they hear what you're saying, but they spit back, well, these are the rules. This is what yeah. we're being told. This is what we've got to do. In fact, 
with one nurse, I said, well, what if that were your parent in the bed? Would you accept the answers that you're giving me? And, you know, she didn't answer the question. She couldn't. I can, I can tell that she was very perplexed. Mm -hmm. And she was afraid to probably express what she really felt. Mm -hmm. Although there were a couple of nurses there that did express to me, you know, quietly that it really sucks. That those were the words that they used. But even though they know it really sucks, it is what it is, right? They're not going to budge off of um, the uh, the controls that are in place. Now, I did ask, I said, well, who's putting these controls in place? I mean, excuse me, who's, who's telling you that you have to operate this way? Remember, they were 24-7, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what I got was the U.S. Department of Health and the CDC are dictating how these, these uh, organizations and these uh, medical facilities are operating. So even in your time of death, right, they are imposing control over dying people, over families who are grieving over the fact that they have a loved one who's going to pass very soon and telling you, in all likelihood, you can't be there. And then with funeral homes, just so you know, right, because I have been involved in, in uh, the funeral arrangements here in North Carolina, they're saying that uh, if you're going to have a viewing, you can't have any more than 10 people in the room at one time. Yeah. So even then, you've got to cycle through family members and friends and family. You know, it's like you almost need a, a doorman right, to sit there and count heads and say, well, you've been here this amount of time, so you need to step out now so somebody else can cycle through and pay their last respects. Churches can't get a church to do anything because they've closed down. Now, I know that that's not everywhere in the country, but in our particular situation, that's what we've been told. And they said, maybe, maybe you can get a priest to come in. Maybe. <laughs> So anyway, I, you know, I didn't want to uh, to kind of let this go. I know, Brian, you and I communicated a little bit, and I said I had some information with regard to uh, how the hospice is, is treating this whole thing with uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19 psychological operation. And uh, I did tell one of the nurses, I said, you know, you know, you do know this thing is a hoax, right? What's and saying? she just just couldn't believe what I, what I was saying. And I, and I wasn't, you know, and I was being very calm about it. Um, it's just that they believe everything that they're fed and uh, they won't budge you off it. It's very frustrating. You know, it's um, one of the things that this particular psycholog psychological operation has shown me is how really, really entrenched and indoctrinated the population yeah. is. You know, a lot yeah. of times in the truth community before this, you would hear truthers say, uh, people into alternative research, there is an awakening, people are waking up and all this stuff. Now, I'm not saying that people aren't waking up and there isn't a heightened awareness, but I've got to tell you folks, based upon my experience here, it, people who are awake, who have eyes to see and ears to hear, you're a very, very small sliver of the population, trust me. It's true. You know, you know, I've got people. One one of the things I did was when I got there, you know, they're all wearing masks and stuff like this, right? And you have to wear a mask. You have no choice to wear a mask to go in and into the hospice. So if I if I didn't put a mask on, as much as I don't want to put a mask on, I don't get to see my family member, right? So I, I was talking to a couple of them there, and I said, um, "So you wear the mask all day?" And they said, "Yeah, yeah." You know, I said, "How do you feel?" I said, "You know." when you wear it, I said, do you have fatigue or anything like that? And they said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I get tired and there's headaches. And I said, you know why, right? And they said, no, why? I said, because you're breathing in, breathing in carbon dioxide. And yeah. that, right? So when you constantly breathe in the carbon dioxide, what's going to happen is you are going to feel fatigued mm -hmm. because it, it, it slows the respiratory system. That's why when people hyperventilate and they put a paper bag over their nose and mouth, 
Mm -hmm. The reason why you're doing that is the carbon dioxide slows the respiratory system down and it keeps somebody from hyperventilating. So I spoke to two or three folks, maybe three, about this. And I just had an off the cuff conversation. I just wanted to see if they had the fatigue symptoms and stuff like that. And lo and behold, they all said, yeah, you know, feel tired and headaches and stuff like that. So that's an interesting thing to me because uh, I think in California, we have uh, a family member out in California. I think they have to wear the masks in public if they don't, um, you know, the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 police are going to uh, tackle them in the street. So, I mean, this is just unbelievable. It really, really is. And I wanted folks to, uh, to get some insight into yeah. how far reaching this is and how it impacts people aside from having your travel restricted. You, you can't even be with a dying relative in their final moments, you know? So, um, really unbelievable. I just wanted to get that out and I'm really glad that you guys, uh, had the time to, to have me talk about it. So if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be more than happy to, to, to answer them the best I can. Or if you have something else you'd like to talk about, you know, so that we don't make this a real short uh, <laughs> video. <laughs> I just find it. I mean, did, there's like no logic to that at all. I mean, the person is they're dying. They're already dying. So what do they what do they think that they're preventing by keeping you from seeing your already dying family member? Yeah, I guess Karen what they're thinking is is that uh they're keeping the the patients that are there even though they're dying, keeping them from dying sooner than they would normally die. In fact, one uh nurse said to me that, you know, we have no cases of COVID-19 here. And I just, you know, I didn't say anything because like I said, I, I don't want to uh, cause a ruckus. Mm -hmm. at the hospice, right? I want to be respectful to other family members there. There are other people that are dying, you know, so you, I, I don't want to cause a big scene. But I'm thinking to myself, the reason why you have no COVID-19 cases here is because there is no COVID-19, right. you know? Do yeah. you know what I'm saying? But but yeah. they don't see this. Now- they all, they all just think it's elsewhere. It's always busy elsewhere in another city, in another state, another hospital, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I've mentioned on, on my own videos that I'm not saying that there's not a flu out there. I mean, we have- We've had the flu ever since, you know, we've inhabited earth and colds and stuff like that, you know. So um, this is their logic. And also when I express to them that their their rule that only one person could be in the you know, one person counts as one person for the entire day, whether they stay for five minutes or 12 hours. I said, you know, why can't somebody else? leave and somebody else replace them in order to cycle family members through so they can see their mother, father, or their grandparent. And they, they said, well, that's- they don't, want to, they don't want to use all the equipment. Is that what they told you? Because they told this other guy that. They said they didn't want to have to give out extra PPE equipment more than once a day. No, what they told me actually was that they said that the more people that come in, the higher the odds are that somebody will walk in with the virus. But I said to them, yeah, I said, I understand that I understand your logic. I said, but here's the thing. The same people are coming every day. Right? So in other words, it's not like we have a bus outside of 50 people that haven't been here before. Yeah. So the same list of people. It's the same, right? It's the same people. So if you've let that person in on Tuesday, but you're saying I'm not going to let him in on Wednesday, but they were already here on Tuesday. Yeah. But Whenever you try to explain the logic to them, but definite flaws in the logic, um, they just shut down. It's almost like you jam their frequencies. They shut down and they resort back to, well, that's the rules. It's, it's so well, crazy. You, I'm sorry, Karen. Go ahead. Um, you can go first. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, I have a nurse friend that's local here that she's a nurse in Charlotte. Um, and she was telling me that she's like, you know, Nobody wants to speak up. None, nobody wants to speak up because the medical system has too much power. She says, yeah. these doctors, these doctors have too much power. She says, people die and they can put whatever they want on that death certificate. And nobody yeah. asks them questions. They can say whatever they want. And she said, you know, if, if you get sick and you're in a hospital and they, you know, they want to put you on a ventilator, 
voluntarily. She's like, trust me, you do not want to be on a ventilator if you don't need it. It is the worst kind of torture. They hold your hands down. Yeah. I mean, the things that are going on, I mean, it's just insanity and nobody wants to break rank, especially the nurses, because, you know, the nurses won't break rank because the doctors don't break rank and the doctors aren't going to break rank because they're, you know, being compensated by all these big pharmaceutical co companies, you know, whatever. They're just all, you know, like you said, fully brainwashed and entrenched in this system. So they're not ready to break rank. So the nurses don't and they can't nobody can do anything because the medical system has been given too much power. Yeah. And what they said, Karen, uh, to me was that um, if, if they break the rules, you know, this is what I was told, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but they said, if they break the rules and they get caught, they will shut the hospice down. Now think about that, right? So you have, you have all these patients there that are dying and you got families coming in to see them. And if they are indeed being threatened with, if you let more than a person in or three people in, right? It's one person. If the person's in the early stages, it's what they call general inpatient, right? right? Which means they're just beginning the process of transition. So that's one person. Once they begin the transition process and they, the doctor has determined that the person has maybe a week or two weeks to live, that's when they up it to three. So if if, you know, when it's one and you have two people in there, or if it's when it's the number is three and you have four people in there, they run the risk of being shut down. Now, can you imagine that? You have all these other patients in there transitioning end of life. Yeah. And you're threatening, you're going to shut the hospice down. It's just, it's mind boggling. It really, really is. And um, it's, crazy it's crazy to even threaten them with that because what that's going to do to them psychologically, you know, the guilt. That's that what I was told. That's even, what even I was though, told. Yeah. I was going to say, even though they can't really shut the whole hospice down, but that's a pretty bold statement by me at this point. <laughs> it's know? unbelievable. When you think about it, I said, look, this whole thing with the way you're working these numbers is immoral. And their response is, no, immoral is that if we let people in who have COVID-19 and coronavirus and infect people, and I, I just, you know, I just rolled my eyes. I, I thought to myself, this is unbelievable. You know, it's like, it's not even like, we have two realities in, in place, right? We have... We have the, the world where we have the people who are entrenched and asleep and just embedded in the matrix. And then we have the very small percentage of people who are truly awake. And it's getting more and more difficult to operate for those two worlds to really interact. It really is. I know from my perspective, it's getting very, very difficult because I, you know, I see the clown show for what it is and they don't see it. No. The separation is huge now more than ever. And I think with this event, I mean, for the last several years, at least people like me and you can be like, yeah, well, these people are so indoctrinated. They just don't get it. But now the way that people behave, it's completely bizarre world because like my, my conversations, I don't know if you've seen them, but with the doctor and the nurse and I recorded them and yeah. I had a nurse telling me, oh, she's going to have me go sit out in my car to diagnose me over the phone. If I have coronavirus, she's also telling me if I hug my grandmother, I'm going to kill her. But yeah. then she also tells me how busy they are. And I already know we pulled in, there were two girls over there laughing and they look surprised by our frigging headlights when me and Christian pulled into urgent care. I'm like, are you here by yourself? She's like, oh no, the rest of the staff is over there. And I'm like, well, I already seen who that is. Right. Yeah. And then I'm like, so, you know, since this whole thing started, you know, and I, I got it out of her where she told me now all she does is look at names on, on a screen. And I, and, but she used to handle all the patients. And I said, oh, when did that start? About two weeks ago. And this was like two weeks ago or three weeks ago I recorded it. She's like, yeah. I'm like, oh. And then she told me how they don't, she won't eat dinner with her family and they'll all have Zoom meetings uh, from different houses. And it's like, dude, I mean, these people, you know what? It made me realize there's a lot less people that are making, out of, making it out of here than I thought. I mean, a lot less. Yeah, a lot less. A lot. They have no hope. Some of them, man. Look, I went to the urgent care. I did a video. Um, I put up on my own channel about a week and a half, two weeks ago, and um, so I went there, and, and they took me back there. By the way, there was nobody in the urgent care, and that particular facility has a combination primary care and urgent care. So they share the same lobby, and I was the only person sitting there. And they will yeah. say, "Well, you know, that's because we have uh, telemedicine. You know, they, they're." diagnosing people over the phone or Zoom or whatever, you know? And I said, okay. Hi, yeah. Oh, hello. Oh, you believe like you're going to die in a week of a deadly disease. Goodbye. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. You know, I, I know, look, we just know human nature. If you're really sick, you're going to go down to the doctor's office, down to urgent care or your primary care, you know? Maybe if you have some symptoms or whatever, you might use the phone. But in any case, 
So I go back there and, um, and I was talking to the, it was a male nurse and he was just, you know, he was just talking and he was telling me that uh, they don't have any testing there. And, you know, what I, what I've learned is there's very little testing in general. The yeah. testing, the testing consists of them diagnosing you. If you have a fever or, you know, cold and flu symptoms, they are told to diagnose you with COVID-19 coronavirus. That's right. Right. So yep. that's how that's how they're they're padding their numbers, and then we've all seen the uh, the reports on the death certificates. Yep. Right, where the government's coming down and telling doctors how to fill out death certificates if they can even remotely tie COVID nineteen or coronavirus to somebody dying from a heart attack or whatever, they're yep. putting it on the death certificates. And we keep hearing all these things about the modeling that they're doing. People need to be very suspect whenever the word model or modeling comes out of somebody's mouth. A model does not mean that they're using real life data, right? Yeah. They're not telling you anything about the model. They're not mm -hmm. telling you about any of the variables or any of the data going in. They're not telling you anything. In fact, I highly suspect there is no model. <laughs> I just think they... They put that into their news articles on the mainstream media platforms. And, you know, of course, most people are going to buy into it because the experts are looking at it, you know? Yeah. So, and then we took a ride. We, we, we then took a ride to three hospitals here in North Carolina, going back about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, during the height of this thing, with all the frenzy of uh, being told that the hospitals were flooded with people who are very sick and people are on ventilators and all that stuff. And we drove to two very large hospitals here in the Raleigh area and a smaller one in a suburb of Raleigh. And there was nobody there. Yeah. There was nobody there. The, the, the loved one, my, our family member who's now in hospice, we had to take him to the, uh, to the emergency room going back about three, three weeks ago, maybe three or four weeks ago. I got to the ER, very, very large hospital in Raleigh. Um, there were three people sitting in the emergency room lobby, aside from our family. There were five of us who, who you know, we took them there and then we, we waited and that was it, you know? And oh, by the way, while we were in the ER, they were blaring CNN throughout oh, yeah. the lobby, the ER lobby, right? Waiting room with coronavirus, COVID-19 fear stuff. Well, well that's, that's how you, it's you twisted. Know, when you think about how are all these nurses buying into it, and we know because the stuff you said earlier, plus they're doing nothing all day but sitting there getting the same fear porn everybody gets yes. anywhere else. And on top of it, they're getting their internal emails and everything that are giving them all these scary numbers. And then back to what we said, right, that even the EMTs in the field will tell you they can't tell the difference between flu or corona. So you're just presumed to have corona. You break, they go to the hospital. What are the nurses going to assume? I worked on all these corona people today. Corona, 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 right. corona, corona, right. corona, corona. Everybody has corona. So they all buy into it. Yep. Yep. We, in, in, when we were in the emergency room, we told them to change the channel and they did. In all fairness, they did. We said, this is, this is completely inappropriate to have this stuff blaring through an emergency room uh, waiting area. I mean, people are already concerned about bringing a family member or a friend to the emergency room. And then you got this, this shit blaring through, you know, the waiting room. It's just unbelievable to me that nobody even has the, the common sense and the common decency to realize but, what they're doing by having that television on that, those particular channels. They're addicted to that fear. It's like almost like they want, they want to have the TV scare them or something. It's they like, feed, you know, they feed on it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now let's talk about the dancing videos for a minute. I mean, as it's so ridiculous that they would be recording all these dance videos and all these hospitals, all these nurses. Right. And if pe yeah. there's people will say, Oh, well they deserve to unwind. They're on break. So you're telling me, first of all, in a pandemic that you can put 10, 15, 20, 30 people on break at once. Okay. That's ridiculous. But let's just be realistic, dude. Um, nobody's going to act like that. If you're watching people dropping fucking dead all day around you, nobody's dancing. I don't give a fuck if you're on break. Nobody's dancing. Nobody's dancing. Nobody's dancing. They got Congo lines going down hallways, which tells you every single one of those rooms is empty because they wouldn't have a Congo line fucking going past it. Yeah. It's, I'm it's telling so you, Brian, we live, 
bell. And then Mike, I'm sorry, but they got the, the thing every day at seven o'clock. It's like a ritual. And they all come down and they blare the sirens and everybody comes out. And they're all shift change. They do it at shift yeah. change every day or something like that. Or once a week. I forget what it is. Yeah, I saw Have that video. That? I what saw do you that think video. About that? That's insane. It's I mean, just all these choreographed dances. I mean, it takes time to come up with these dances and everybody has to learn it and then you have to practice it and then they film it. I don't think people, it's like, it's not like they just turned on a camera and everybody started dancing the same. Yeah. It's like, it's like we live, we do, we live in a cartoon. We really do. And for people to behave like that and to put those things together, like you said, you know, they've got a choreograph. They have to, I'm going to do this. You do that. You know, this is not like spur of the moment you get 10 people together and all of a sudden it comes together. That's the type of thing that has to be practiced. And it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, I mean, you know, can you do that at your job? I mean, could you just on a break, get a bunch of people together and start dancing and videotaping it? I mean, I, I, I tell I you couldn't. what, I could, even if I could do that in my job, which I couldn't, but let's just say I could do that. It's a restaurant, yeah. right? Um, there's people dying around you. How fucking disrespectful right. is it to, see you laughing and dancing on the internet when their loved ones in the next room dying even if it's not covid even if their loved one isn't dying but they're in there because they have an injury you're out here fucking fooling around like this on the internet they would in real life mike if this wasn't a shitty movie that we lived in every single one of them would be fired and every hospital will be sued but we know that's not going to happen at all but that's no. if it was real world if this was real <laughs> you know yeah and i like to just point out to folks uh i'm starting to see now though that i i was looking at the um the headlines on uh, Fox News, right? I, I pick on Fox News, but you can do CNN, MSNBC, it doesn't matter. It's the same stuff. And uh, I'm starting to see uh, some of the COVID-19 coronavirus stuff starting to now slip into the memory hole. Like I went into uh, Fox News today and we could see we're back to the uh, the political left-right nonsense, Yeah. right? It's still somewhat tied into coronavirus and COVID-19, but... Yeah. Uh, my suspicion is that over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see it just go away and then they'll be back to the usual nonsense that they're reporting on. You know, um, it's one big psychological operation. There was one article last week on Fox news where they said that their modeling now shows that the numbers may have been overstated. <laughs> yeah. And then there was another article that was, let me see if I can, I have it here, I think. Yeah. It was on um, ABC News, which is out of New York, saying that a Stanford study suggests that COVID-19 may be 80, 50, excuse me, 50 to 80 times higher than the official count. So this is another tactic that they use, which is yeah. they, they play both sides. It's just right, like Fauci the field. and Trump. It's like Fauci and Trump, good cop, bad cop. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. It's all ping pong back and forth all the time. Yep. So, and that's just to screw with people's heads. And uh, you, know, you read one article and they say, oh, it looks like it's uh, it's not so bad. And another article is saying, oh, it's a lot worse. And of course, what they're going to do is once this thing, because um, they keep talking about flattening the curve, everybody has the same, right? Same, words. That that's they use, the same words. That's the other thing too, when they, when they have these irrational thoughts. I know they've always had the same words. Like how many years have we heard refraction, gravity, these types of things. But like the way they are now, their program responses all match each other. Like exactly. It's insane, bro. It's like they, I, I've been saying it and I know people don't have to agree, but it's like they all took an update, a consciousness update or something like right, right before this Corona thing. And so they act extra crazy and weird and aggressive and all this at once. I mean, yeah. that's just what it seems like to me. I can't prove any of that, but they are acting totally insane in the head, dude. I mean, with the sayings, right? It's insane. Yeah. And what's going to happen is um, they're going to come out and they're going to say that the numbers did not reach the levels that they had uh, thought it might. And it was because everybody obeyed. Everybody was compliant. So because you stayed home and locked yourself up, because you yep. put a mask on and yep. because you social distanced, because you were good, you were a good boy and girl and you followed the rules, you averted catastrophe, disaster. So, I mean, they really have no way of losing this thing because the vast majority of the masses are just going to say, yeah, it's a good thing I stayed at home. It's a good thing I just locked myself up, wore my mask, and I kept six feet from my fellow human being. We averted a disaster. You know, that's how it's going to play out. It's really sad.
Karen, you're muted. Karen's trying to talk. Sorry. One thing I realized when um, when all this came out, okay, the whole thing with the viruses not being what we're told, not working like that, okay, that's huge, okay? That is, it's like, to me, I see a lot of parallels between what we're going through now and like when everybody first woke up to flat earth because it's like, you know, this new information comes out that, you know, the world is not what we're told and um, everybody is learning about it. And then we're trying to tell everybody, hey, look, the world's not like we're told, but we come up against all this resistance because everybody's all, everybody believes the earth is a globe. And they're like, no, what are you talking about it? You know, and it's almost like the same scenario is playing out, but this time it's with yeah. inner space, not outer space, right? Like they did the outer space lie, right? right? And they did the inner space lie which they laid a foundation for hundred over a hundred years ago, probably, you know, the same time they did the globe, right? If you think about it, what the actual timeline is, it's probably right around the same timeline, right? Because yeah. the globe lie is about a hundred years old. That's when they started pushing it. And that's also very similar to the same time when this whole thing with viruses came out and Louis Pasteur and blah, blah, blah. So at the same time, back then, they made a fake outer space and then they made a fake inner space. So everybody found out about the fake outer space. And then once that started getting out and everybody's, you know, that started to get popular, it started to not become such a big deal to say you're a flat earther anymore. And so five years we've been going at this and then boom, pff, the inner space bomb drops. And yeah. suddenly nobody's talking about flat earth anymore. And we're all over here going, wait, 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 wait. This isn't, nothing is like what we're told. You know, viruses don't, this isn't even a real thing. It's not, it, viruses don't cause disease. You know, you can't catch anything like that. And everybody is now afraid of this fake thing that's on the inside. And it is just as unfalsifiable and unverifiable for the normal person as outer space is. Yeah. And so like now we're sort of stuck in this. It's a really hard situation for us because, you know, it was hard enough to try to convince people about space being fake, but now you want to try to tell them that germ theory is not real. And Hey, guess what? You, you know, all these vaccines, I mean, it's just so overwhelming and it is diabolically evil and genius. And it, it's like what you were saying, man, realizing that the majority of people are so entrenched, they have, they have gone for it. They are fully invested in it. 100% hook, line, and sinker. Nobody's going to tell these people any different. And it was like somebody on Facebook put a post um, the other day. They're like, what was the saddest day of your life, right? What was the saddest day of your life? Instead of the happiest, the saddest day. This guy says, and he put something like February something when I found something out. And I said, the saddest day for me was March 12th, 2020, when it was made blatantly obvious that the majority of Americans have mushed for brains or yeah. a majority of the world because all this stuff, like we can sit here and, and show everybody the scientific papers, uh, papers from resources that they should be trusting, that they themselves say, oh, you should trust the scientific community. You should trust, you know, all these people. And that's where we're drawing these this information from that viruses don't work the way that they do, that AIDS isn't, you know, HIV doesn't cause AIDS. There's no proof that any of this works the way that it does. And so you can sit here and we can show these people all this stuff from these same sources that they're saying we should trust. And it doesn't do anything. Nobody see and they don't want to accept it. They, even if it's from the same source that they're saying that they tell you to trust. And it's, I mean, I don't really know what I, I, I kind of am left like dumbfounded right now. Well, what do we do? What I've do we concluded do? Karen that <laughs> I've concluded that it really is an individual journey here. You know, for the longest time, we talked about critical mass and, uh, you know, the collective and consensus and all that stuff, trying to get people on board. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to reach out, continue to reach out. I still do that. You guys do that. Right. But at the end of the day, uh, I've a long time ago, I've stepped back and said, you know, this is really about my journey. This is Mike's journey here. Mm -hmm. And it's my learning. And it's my experience and it's my soul's development that's taking place. And to the degree and the extent that I can help other people to see things and, and hear things, fine. But it's not my responsibility overall to convince anybody of anything because what will happen is knowing what we've seen with this whole coronavirus COVID-19 deal is 
it would be a gigantic and is, if you continue to pursue it, one giant wheel spinning exercise, trying to get people to see things that are clearly visible. They don't want to see it. And the other thing with this is that what the what the system does is um, they overload everybody, even us, right, with this information because yeah. what oh, happens, man. Hey, they overload I, us. If I take half a day off, there's so much I can't even catch up. This is so – I mean, I had to take a few days off and just say I'll just jump back in in two days. I mean, I can't even keep up with it. There's so much. And what we have to do is we have to try to keep the our eye on the ball because while they're doing this, we know they're doing other stuff. We, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. They get everybody to look over here to the right. And in the meantime, no one's looking left. And looking left is where they're really doing things, right? Pushing the agenda forward, passing legislation, doing whatever it is that they do on a daily basis. Like Trump passing the 5G bill yeah. on March 23rd? Yep, exactly. And, you know, you're in the same state as me. So I'm sure you've seen all of the equipment running around. People are installing 5G repeaters everywhere. Yep, yep. And... Um, and so it becomes, and what happens is our hands is get tied up because as being people in the truth community and the alternative research community, we want to get information out to try to get people to wake up, but we almost become overwhelmed and consumed with the level of information that's coming. And then I'm guilty of it myself where I'm not looking to the left like I should be as much as I should be. You know what I'm saying? So they yeah, tie us. They tie us up. Backtrack too much. You're trying to backtrack too much to catch all these people that are ten years behind and never wanted to look into anything. Yeah, and it's handcuffing us. It's handcuffing us. You know. Yep. Like 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 with people with the virus, it's like now I got to tell them about nine eleven and Apollo. I mean, like where do we start? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I know. I mean, it. Where do you start? I mean, even something as simple as these days is the, the JFK assassination, right? This should be a no brainer for everybody by this time. And there's still people out there believing in the one bullet theory and Lee Harvey Oswald and stuff like that. I mean, again, like, you know, we, it's, it really is an individual journey. That's how I, I see it. It is an individual journey. I agree. But I also think like another kind of, and I almost hate to admit that I've been thinking this way recently, but it's almost like, you know, it's like if people don't get it at this this point, it's like, well, I don't know what, I, there's not really much hope for you at this point. If you don't see even a little bit of it, enough to start asking questions at this point, I just, you're just going to have to stay where you are. And the rest of us are just going to have to go forward, which is kind of like me and Brian, like we don't do debates. We don't debate Globies anymore. We don't do that. No, because there is no debate. That's a wa total waste, total waste of time. time. Complete waste of time. Yep. I don't want to talk about whether or not the earth is flat. For me, there's no debate. The earth is not a globe. End of story. Now what I want to know is how do things really work here? What's really going on? And um, how do we <laughs> take this place back? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's all I really care about. You know, people are so programmed. The analogy I use, Karen and Brian, is, um, you know, they, they think of it as like a hard drive in your brain. And there's, there's computer code, there's software running on that hard drive. And uh, for a lot of folks, I mean, they, they just cannot break out uh, whatever that programming is. So it would be like asking a spreadsheet to be a uh, like Microsoft Word, right? So ask, you want yeah. Excel to operate like Microsoft Word. Well, that's never going to happen because Excel is a spreadsheet, right? And, and Word is not. And... Uh, that's why it's very, very difficult. And the programming for so many people is so embedded that there is no hope for them. There, there really isn't. And that's why we have to pick and choose our battles. And we can only do what we can do as far as trying to get people to wake up. Right? Because yeah. So many people are walking around. They're lost. I mean, they're completely lost. And they will be lost for their entire, for the entire time period that they are here on earth. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there'll be other people that will wake up for sure. But I'm telling you, the machine that's in place is a constant perpetual state of indoctrination. Everywhere you go, people have their television sets on, they're staring at their phones, they're constant, you know, and, um, and that's why it's very hard to make a dent in it, because people have got themselves conditioned. This is their habit. This is their routine.
I look at my television. I listen to it every single day. I look at my phone every single day. You know, I, it's unbelievable. It really is. Yeah. I don't sound too doom and gloom, but I know I probably do, but no, no, but you don't sound too doom and gloom because you're talking about, you know, you see, you see us turning the corner and I see it turning the corner a bit too. What's going to come next. I mean, I don't know, but I, yeah. do I think, do I think we're going to get round up and thrown in camps? Like a lot of people think and um, he's on the street. No, I don't, I never, no, no, and I still, no, you know, no, so it's just frustrating, Brian, for doom me, doom it just, doom. You're not like AM TV or anything, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I guess for me, if it sounds a little negative is because, you know, this whole thing with this hospice situation, really, really, you know, I, I knew people were gone, but I, I just couldn't believe that it was so gone that even in a time of dying, it's controlled. Oh, they don't give a fuck about that. They don't get. They don't give a fuck. You're absolutely right. It's insanity, and it makes no logical sense. No, no. <laughs> and no, not to you and me and Brian, but for the yeah. for the I sleepers. Mean, Karen made parallels to flat Earth, and I want to make parallels to 9/11 as well. I mean, the way that they pit the. Um, you know, you can't question this to a cop or a firefighter about 9/11 back then. You can't question this to a nurse. Like it's just. You're just being so disrespectful. What about and 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 everybody knows a cop. Everybody knows a nurse, right? So everybody right. thinks they're connect. Everybody thinks they're connected to somebody on the front lines, and they're being propped up as being on the front lines of a war against the invisible enemy. It's just like 9/11. Yeah, it is. And then then it's obviously we can, we can it's get into all the enemy. Fakery. We get right. all all the fakery aspects and the compartmentalization. It's just how that's how they operate, you know. And they it's play a people. Continuation up. of the war on terror. Right. Absolutely. Because yeah. it's the new terrorist. And now the terrorist, the, they don't even, you can't even identify him with a turban. Right. No. No. <laughs> no. And you, you titled the video. You did that one video, Karen, on the virus uh, that rant you did on your channel. And I think you said it was uh, the new terrorism, right? Virus, the new terrorist. New terrorism. Like that. That's yeah. what it is. Cause they're, and they can just crank out a new one every year a new mutated terrorist virus can come out every yep. year and then they can impose the instructions and shut everyone down and scare you until you need a vaccine to go in public and take away cash and blah 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 etc cetera, etc cetera. the whole laundry list of things that people being scared of an invisible virus enables them to do yep. which is a whole shitload of bad stuff no this is going <laughs> to sound racist but you guys know i'm just saying it because this was the mindset back then at least after 9/11 if I wanted to be scared of somebody, I could spot out the towel head, right? Because he mm -hmm. might be the guy with the bomb, right? Who do you spot out now when it could be any human? Now, if or anybody, anybody, anybody could be the enemy, right? Right. Yeah. They don't, they don't the deadly virus that is going to infect you and kill you. It's your family yeah. member. Right. It's your, your cat. Yeah, they don't go to the zoo. Cat, best friend. That's right. Everything. It's everywhere. Yeah, because a tiger oh. might have it, you know. <laughs> the tiger, that's right, the tiger. <laughs> I would think that. Well, Vo Vox put out this new video because they're always making disinfo videos. And what they're really pushing out is the most dangerous people are the asymptomatic people. You know, the people that aren't synced, that don't show any symptoms, those are the most deadly people. It's like <laughs> completely backwards logic, dude. It's unbelievable. And they, they have those people thinking you're carrying it. You're just not going to show symptoms for weeks. Therefore, stay away from everybody. And it's just like what they tell the nurses. Oh, it's the calm before the storm. It's it's all the same thing. You know what I mean? It's always future state. If you notice their tactics, it's always projecting into the future on just about everything. It's not here yet. We haven't done it yet. We're planning yeah. to do it. It's going <laughs> to happen, right? We always get that. That's what we always get. Mm -hmm. And get, what happens is people then project because humans love doing that. They love to worry. Right. Worrying is wishing for something that you don't want to have happen. Right. So they, they move forward and they project these worst case scenarios. And one of the things that folks have to understand is the people behind this the, in the pyramid of power, they understand human psychology like like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. They really do. They have it mastered. They know exactly how to manipulate the, the masses and they know what what humans do. You know, and worrying is one of the things that we do best. Mm hmm. Like, just look at like when, if, if we wanted to, we would never do this because me and Karen are good people. 
But the way these people are brainwashed, if we wanted to manipulate them in any way, psychologically, we could easily do it. Now think about the people that have had the information and the power for however many years you want to think it's been around. Yeah. I mean, it's it's nothing to them. It's nothing to them. It's like little ants in a farm, dude. It's nothing to them. Look how especially, the way people react. Especially, Brian, when they own the entire apparatus to get their message out. Right? Yes. That's the thing. So if you and I it would be difficult because we'd have to do you know one by one. They can just get the whole thing and APB gets put out and everybody, all of their networking, which includes the governments, the media, the military, everything falls right in line. And that's, and that's what's pumped into everybody's living room. You know, it's all pumped in and uh, it's so coordinated uh, that it's really mind boggling when you think about it, how coordinated it is. I was, I had a, an email exchange with Matt from uh, quantum of conscious the other day, and we got a little bit into uh, how, how this coordination takes place. And I had shared my thoughts with Matt, but just quickly, I don't know if you guys are the folks who are listening or watching um, the HBO series Westworld. Okay. So the series Westworld, which is in season three currently, is telegraphing to the audience, to people who have eyes to see and ears to hear, mm -hmm. how the reality works and what's going on. So I don't want to uh, to have a spoiler here, but if you're not watching that, it's well worth, I think, your time to watch it. You know, some people will say, well, I don't watch any of that stuff because, you know, it's put out there by, by the controllers and so on. But the thing is, a lot of what they're putting out there is actually telling you the truth. It's actually telling you how things work and where things are going. That's why we have the whole predictive programming piece of this thing, right? Mm -hmm. But in season three of, of Westworld, there's a very, very good episode where they show that there's an artificial intelligence in place. And that artificial intelligence, it's constantly gathering up data, uh, making computations, doing computations, playing scenarios. And this allows the people who are in control to be able to, you know, real time to see how things could play out. And in that one episode, and I said, I wouldn't do a spoiler, but I'll just do it this, this for this one episode. They show one of the first things that they, uh, they manipulated was the stock market. One of the very first things that they did from a computing perspective an AI was the manipulation of the stock market. This is why if you're in the stock market, you have to be very aware that the entire thing is controlled, cradle mm -hmm. to grave, mm -hmm. right? So anyway, I'll just put that out there for anybody who wants to, uh, who's awake and uh, wants to watch a series that I think is intelligently written um, to get some perspectives. They may not walk away with the same perspectives that I that I have from it, but uh, I'm getting a lot out of that show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people talk about that show. I should watch it. I just don't yeah. like watching TV anymore. <laughs> so. Yeah, me neither, Karen. <laughs> I, I don't watch it. Uh, we we selectively watch certain shows, mm -hmm. and usually it's a series. And um, we just kind of stumbled onto Westworld. I didn't watch it right away. I kind of caught up. And then I started watching it, and I thought to myself, this is very interesting what they're telling us here. You know, and um, so again, I won't talk too much about it because folks are going to watch it, and and uh, I don't want to ruin it for them. <laughs> so that's all I had. I don't know. I don't want to uh, prolong the discussion here, unless you guys have anything else you wanted to talk yeah. about. I think uh, I think that's about all I got, Karen. What about you? Anything else you want to get into? No, no. I think that was. I don't have anything right else right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess we could keep it to this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brian and Karen. It was great to finally talk to you. Karen and I have been Facebook friends for a long time. And yeah. And I will get back to the show soon. I'm just a little, I need a break from yeah. the four and a half hour presentation documentary I did on the Beatles. How did the, uh, Turned so me you, out. How did the feedback for you work out on that? Very good. Um, you know, I knew that when I did it, it was interesting and I kept it very close to the vest. Uh, and I, there were a lot of people that were trying to guess as to what was going to be in it, you know. 
And um, so when I finally released it, uh, I think it was um, shocking to a lot of people. Uh, but I have to say that the overall response has been overwhelmingly positive. Of course, you do get those people, you know, who just want to, you know, they want to go nuts and tell you, you you're, you're out of your mind and so on. But these are people that didn't watch the documentary, didn't watch the presentation, because if you watched it and you have a brain in your head, you know, I, I step everybody through it. And, uh, you know, so so a lot of the a lot of the negative stuff were from people that would have been negative regardless. You know, the people that thumbs thing, you know, they give you the thumbs down before they ever watch anything, that group, you know, mm -hmm. and um, they don't watch any of your stuff. For some reason, they just uh, have a hair up their ass about you or what it is that you're talking about. But that's okay. I mean, those people are uh, not the people that I'm speaking to anyway. And, and they are few and far between when I measure it against the, the total number of people that are engaged with the uh, with the shows that I put up in the presentation. So to answer your question, Brian, it's gone very, very well. It's very positive. I've gotten a lot of feedback, good feedback, great feedback from uh, PMs on Facebook, emails, the comments and stuff like that. So thank you for asking. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, I guess we'll get out of here. Mods, can you link uh, Mike's YouTube channels and his uh, blog in here? There you go, P900, Sandra's taking care of it right now. So make sure you guys follow Mike on, over on there. Um, Karen, you ready to get out of here? I'm done. Yep. Until later. Mm -hmm. uh, me and Karen will be live tonight. It's supposed to be my turn, but Karen, you want to do it on your channel tonight? Uh, It doesn't matter. We can do it either okay. way. Yeah, you guys will find us. We'll be either on my channel or hers. Depends how many videos I put out. I might put out a couple short videos, but if not, we'll just do it. On Wait, you're, are you out of notifications for today? <laughs> no, well, for right now, that's why I came over here, but in a couple hours, I, I'll, I'll be privileged to have two notifications. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they'll leave let me go, maybe they'll even let me go outside. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank All you. Right. We'll keep it short. I'll see you guys later. And I will mirror this on the main channel later. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye.